word Islam means to submit. Submit to the will of God. So we believe that Islam did not start with Prophet Muhammad. It started from Adam. Simply obeying God, obeying the Prophet of the time was Islam. So if you lived during the time of Moses and you were from the Israelites and you believed in God and you followed Moses, you were a Muslim. Similarly, if you lived during the era of Jesus and you believed in God and followed the teachings of Jesus Christ, you were a Muslim, you were a follower of Islam. Islam mean to me is a way of life, right? Uh, if you're asking for literal meaning, it means uh, submission. So to submit your will to God is uh, to worship none other than the one God of Islam. Uh, and the way we do this is we pray five times a day. Uh, that's our act of worship. There are other active acts of worship as well. Uh, we call him Allah, uh, but it is the same God of uh, Adam, Noah, you know, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Moses, Jesus, uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, you know, peace and blessing upon them all. Uh, so that's the God we worship and we submit to. The word Islam itself means peace. To be at peace with yourself, to be at peace with your neighbors, and to be at peace with God. Islam is the only religion in the world, or Abrahamic religion, that follows every single prophet God sent upon humanity, starting from Adam. And you know, Muslims, we believe the prophecy ended with Prophet Muhammad, uh, but we believe every single prophet was sent by God to humanity. We have one direction which we all face when we are praying. We believe in Mecca is the most beloved land to God, and it is the place of uh, Abraham's uh, first building, the house of God, which is the Kaaba. We believe that is the first house that was built for the worship of, of God. And if you were living north of Mecca, then you would be facing south. Uh, right, so if you, were fa if you were living east of Mecca, then you would be facing west. Uh, five the first is to profess your faith, uh, where you actually say the words uh, that I believe in God, one God, and I believe in Prophet Muhammad as his messenger. The second is to pray five times a day. The third is to fast in the month of Ramadan, which is the ninth month of the lunar calendar. And the fourth is to give two and a half percent of your savings to the needy and poor. And the fifth is to perform the Hajj uh, once in a lifetime. Hajj is, a, Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam. It is a requirement for anyone and everyone who can financially afford it and also is healthy enough to make the journey, is able to make the journey, he must perform this Hajj once in a lifetime. Ramadan is a month of spirituality. It is a month of fasting. It is a month of celebration because it is the month in which God sent down his revelation. So it is one whole month of celebrating the re divine revelation that was sent for the guidance of mankind. We fast every day in the month uh, from dawn to sunset for 29 or 30 days. An imam is one who takes care of the religious needs of the community. The word imam in Arabic means the guy in front because he is in front of everyone when he is leading the five daily prayers, he's called the imam. We don't have a religious hierarchy as such, so he's not necessarily religiously closer or spiritually closer to God. Any adult male can lead the prayer. Uh, but what happens is for the sake of convenience, the congregation or the management of the mosque will designate or choose or hire a designated imam. So five daily prayers are, there is a window of time for each of these prayers and they can be prayed individually or in congregation. Uh, so if you pray in congregation, you get more brownie points. Uh, so some people, they, would, they prefer to pray in congregation. And that's where the imam comes in. His job would be to lead the prayer. There is 
I would say four main postures. One is the standing position, one is the bowing position, and the other third position is where you actually put your uh, nose and forehead on the ground. Uh, the ultimate posture in which anyone can put himself in to express his total humility and his nothingness in front of someone. And that's what we are doing in front of God. And the fourth is the sitting posture. So each unit uh, consists of these postures. And there's at least two or three or four units in each prayer. The Friday prayer, uh, it, Friday is our holy day. And people ask, why Friday? I say, well, first came Moses, and he got first pick. So he picked Saturday. Then, then came the Christians, they got Sunday. We were left with Friday. Um, but yes, Friday is the, is the holy day, the day in which the whole community is to come together and pray the Friday prayer in the mosque. Well, prayer, uh, we can use it, it's used generically. Uh, one is that you're looking for a parking spot, so you say, God, give me a <laughs> parking spot. Uh, that's a prayer. But in the Muslim community, when you say the word prayer, it usually refers to the five daily prayers. Uh, very ritual, exact uh, form and formation, no difference of opinion. All one billion plus Muslims pray in exactly the same uh, fashion. And that uh, is, you have to recite passages from the Quran in those prayers. Uh, whatever you have memorized. So even though you don't sometimes understand what you are reciting, if Arabic is not your native tongue, but you, every Muslim has memorized at least a few passages from the Quran enough to be able to recite them in his daily prayers. Quran to the Muslims would be similar in rank and station to Jesus in Christianity. Basically a form of representation of God on earth. Quran is the word of God, the speech of God, and this is as close as you can get to God. Uh, so we believe this is the exact verbatim, word to word, of God's speech. The Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the conduit uh, from which the Quran came from God to humanity uh, through Angel Gabriel. Regarding Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I think it's important for us to understand where he fits in in the family tree of prophets. Abraham, who we all accept, uh, had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Now in this side of the family tree, Isaac and uh, Sarah, there were literally hundreds of prophets. Uh, we're talking about David, Solomon, Moses, and in the end, Jesus Christ came from this side of the family tree. Uh, Isaac and Sarah. From this side of the family tree, Hagar and Ishmael, for 3,500 years, there were no prophets till Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. So we don't believe that uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is uh, any sort of uh, deity or anything. Uh, we follow him as a perfect example of what a Muslim should be. Uh, and those before him as well, so Jesus, peace be upon him, and Moses, and Abraham. We do view him with a great deal of respect because he was the individual who was chosen by God to receive the revelation and then pass it on to everyone else. Um, and we do think that he was, you know, the highest level of a human being in terms of following God and doing it in as perfect of a manner as possible. But it's also important to note that he was human. He didn't do everything perfectly, and we also have very deep records of, you know, how how you go through the process of um, reckoning with mistakes that you make in your religion and to know that someone who had reached that pinnacle also made mistakes, it gives the rest of us hope. He's not just someone who stuck his head out of a tent in the desert of Arabia and said, I, I'm a prophet. No, uh, he would say that I am the son of Ishmael, Abraham, and I am the result. I am the result of the prayer that Abraham made to God to send a prophet amongst his descendants. When I hear the word that this country was founded on Judeo-Christian values, I'm a little bit taken aback because uh, I'm like, what about us? Uh, because to be honest, the three monotheistic religions have a lot in common. Uh, 
So I would say this country was founded on Abrahamic values. Um, I think Christians and Jews and Muslims specifically are very similar. Uh, we all believe in the Abrahamic faith and the prophet Abraham. And I think Muslims in particular, um, they believe in Jesus, they believe in Moses, um, and to the extent that those were individuals and not manifestations of God, similar to the prophet Muhammad. Um, and really we believe that God is one God, but a lot of the teachings that you see in the Torah or in the Old Testament are actually teachings that Muslims also follow. We believe in the life hereafter. We, first and foremost, we believe in the originator of life, God, the supreme being. Whether we call him God or Allah or Yahweh, we believe in prophets, we believe in divine revelation, we believe in angels, we believe in the afterlife, that going to the grave is not the end of the story. Uh, so we have this set of beliefs that bring us together. Otherwise, when it comes, to, again, to being a good person, being a good Muslim, or being a good Christian, or being a good Jew, there's not much difference. All religions teach the same basic values, be good to your neighbor, etc. Every Muslim in the world is required to believe in seven, the seven tenets of faith. First and foremost, to believe in God, the creator of all life. The second is to believe in angels. Uh, they are a creation of God. And the third is to believe in the scriptures that from time to time God sent his revelation through his chosen prophets. And the fourth is to believe in all the prophets, Adam being the first human being and the first prophet to Prophet Muhammad being the last prophet and all the prophets that came in between. Uh, and we believe in the last day, that a time will come when this world will end. Only God knows, not even Prophet Muhammad knew, and the Mayans definitely did not know when this world was going to end. Uh, but we believe that it will end, and that's in the knowledge of God. And the sixth tenet of faith is to believe in destiny. Whatever happens, good or bad, was meant to be. It doesn't mean that God is the puppet master and he's pulling the strings and we don't have a choice. We have been given the willpower to choose and we are expected to choose right over wrong. And the seventh tenet of faith is to believe in the afterlife, that when we die, it's not the end. A time will come when we will rise from our graves, shaking dirt from our hair, and we will be answerable to God for everything that we have said or done in this world. The main tenet, which is believing in God, right? Everything else that follows, it leads back to God. So God is a, is a centerpiece of, of uh, Islam. Culture tells us many different things, but Islam tells us a whole different side. Sharia law is basically a set of guidelines, not, not necessarily laws in black and white for which there is punishment, but guidelines by which a Muslim leads his daily life. Uh, anywhere from washing your hands before you eat. Uh, that's why I say it's more about washing your hands than about cutting hands and also eating kosher, eating halal. So all of this uh, falls under uh, the realm of Sharia law. It's for the betterment of society, their uh, economic growth. Uh, people should have a way of earning a halal livelihood. Uh, they should feel f uh, secure and safe and protected. Their life and property should be protected. That all falls under Sharia law. Jihad means to struggle in the path of God. So for example, what we should be struggling towards is uh, refraining from sin and going towards the way of God. So that is true jihad. When it comes to war in Islam, uh, the Quran actually prohibits war in Islam. It's never justified unless it's out of self-defense. So it's not, it's not telling us to just go out and start war with people. This isn't jihad. Jihad is to struggle in the path of God from uh, you know, like the path of Satan. In the books, it's referred to as the struggle of good against evil because there will always be evil in the world. And if the people of good, if the people of tr truth, if they don't stand up against evil, then evil will dominate. I think first people, uh, the myths need to be debunked. Uh, so all the mis misconceptions out there that needs that air needs to be cleared. Uh, 
in Islam there is respect and safeguarding the rights of minorities. There is tolerance. Islam, would, I would say, is the first religion that preached tolerance. Um, there is the rights of women. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are so many things out there that people have all these misconstrued views and those need to be uh, done away with. The Quran, the religion, um, is very different than the culture that is pre portrayed. Uh, the Quran is very empowering to women and uh, I think the lack of knowledge that people have about it is very upsetting. Um, so I haven't always looked like a Muslim woman. I have not always worn hijab. So I can speak from the perspective of a Muslim woman who doesn't wear hijab and Muslim woman who follows Islamic dress code. And if I compare to um, as somebody who wears hijab, I uh, experience more respectful encounters with people around me. And I do my housewife work too. I cl uh, cook and clean, I take care of my family, but I also work a full-time job as a healthcare professional. I have some uh, side work as a clinical nursing instructor. I volunteer in the community and I practice Taekwondo. I decided to wear the headscarf halfway through eighth grade and um, no one else in my family did it and I wasn't pressured at all to do it. I kind of just decided on a whim that this is something that I wanted to incorporate into my identity. And um, I think that I actually find it empowering. I've noticed since I started wearing the scarf, people started treating me, especially men, uh, treated me less like a girl and more like an individual who has thoughts to contribute. It constantly reminds me that I am an ambassador for Islam. So it forces me to be better, but it also helps other people interact with someone different from them. Um, I think it's definitely something when you're walking in the hallway and people are keep unquestioning you. Do you sleep with it? Do you, do you shower with it? But at the end of the day, I think um, I try to be an example of a free Muslim woman because people always think my parents made me wear it or I'm oppressed or whenever I go visit my family, I'm getting an arranged marriage. But I think at the end, it's I try to educate people and be an example of what a Muslim should be. It's someone's choice because it's man, just like anything else, it's mandatory in the religion, but at the end, of it, we get that free will to choose it, whether we want it or not. And I, I think I treat it as a crown, and I say to myself, I get to style it every day, I get to choose the color, and my, my friends and I even joke about it being a different hair color every day. It protects me in a way. Uh, as I said earlier, I wasn't always wearing this, so I know what it feels like without hijab. Um, it really, it brought some sort of respect from others. Um, people don't um, look, they don't look at my looks. They look at what I say and what's, uh, what I think, what, how I behave. Islam is the religion, Muslim is the practitioner of the faith of the religion Islam, very similar to Christianity and Christian. I think most people don't understand that Islam isn't a race or ethnicity. It's a religion, it's a way of life. And Muslims come in different colors uh, from different corners of the world. And that's what's so beautiful about our religion, that overwhelming diversity of cultures. We're a peaceful religion, and I think that understanding that just goes a really long way. I want people to know that I'm Muslim. I'm proud of it. What has been found is that, that a person, a non-Muslim, who has one-on-one -on -one interaction with a Muslim, that is the most effective way of debunking the myths. As humans, we have some sort of human decency towards each other, uh, and so that's one thing. Uh, and we are encouraged to think of the entire humanity. Uh, a lot of times in the Quran, uh, God refers to all of humanity, not just Muslims. Uh, and we believe that our Prophet, peace be upon him, was sent to all of mankind as a mercy. And so to be merciful towards others and you know to love thy neighbor. I would love to ask my, you know, Christian 
uh, brothers, uh, LDS brothers, anybody out there to overcome this stigma, to overcome this taboo, create a communication channel, okay? Bridge those gaps. This is how we're gonna come together. Do not listen to media, challenge media. Come and ask and talk to your neighbors if they are Muslim, talk to your friends if you're, they are Muslims, talk to your classmates, your teacher, whoever. Um, of course, you know, I think as Muslim, us, we have to do a lot of work. You know, this misperception is not just coming from the West, unfortunately. I think it's a good step forward to acknowledge that as a Muslim community, we also have to do a lot to um, represent our community. We binge the same shows on Netflix as you do. So uh, I think just, you know, if you see a Muslim, just be open-minded and um, be open-minded in terms of the media that you're consuming and just the decisions that you're making based off of that. The beauty of, uh, of electronic world is every information is at the tip of your finger. Research. Do not take, uh, you know, media, what media is saying is a blanket uh, statement. Um, this is how we're going we're gonna to come together as a human race. The teachings of Islam um, bring me structure in my life. It makes me grounded. It makes me humble. Um, it makes me grateful. Islam is a religion of peace and mercy to all humankind. To people who don't understand Islam, I would urge them, encourage them, and request them with folded hands that uh, before you make up your mind uh, about Islam or Muslims, I think you should go and read the Holy Book of Quran. Life is about choices, and Islam helps me make the right choices in life. Because I'm sure all of us have made decisions, later on we look back, hindsight is 2020, and we say, oh, what was I thinking? I think Islam helps, uh, religion helps a person make the right choices in life so he has less regrets as he looks back in, at his life. Utah Islamic Center was formed in 2007 and like many mosques in America, before they have a purpose-built mosque, they start off as a rent, with a rental place and we were in a strip mall for the first 13 years and now we finally have a home of our own. Uh, it was a long, lengthy process, uh, but definitely worth it. It's a home away from home. It is actually the home that a person should feel more connected to uh, when it comes to you know, his spirituality. It is the go-to place when a person needs anything, he should feel that this is where I can go and I will be listened to and I, my needs will be met. Um, so it's, it's a place of meditation, it's a place of service, not just to the Muslim community, but to the non-Muslim community. Um, so it's a place to get together, to socialize, and of course, on top of everything, it's a place to worship. We focused on functionality, the flow of traffic, the views of different rooms in the mosque. So rather than building big and beautiful, it turned out that we build something that is big, beautiful, and yet very functional as far as the aspects of daily usage is concerned. When it came to the design of this building, uh, we wanted a building that blended with the local architecture because Islam is not Eastern or exotic or foreign. It is very much part of this society, this country as Apple Pie and Thomas Jefferson. So we wanted the architecture to represent that uh, and blend in with the local architecture. We did not want our mosque to look like a transplant from Saudi Arabia or from Pakistan. And I think we have succeeded in that because nine out of 10 of our non-Muslim neighbors, when they drive by, they don't realize it's a mosque. Even though they see a 40-foot minaret, but it doesn't strike them as a mosque. Um, and you see a mosque in China, 1200 year old mosque, it looks like a, ch a Chinese architecture. So we wanted to do that with our mosque. Uh, second uh, feature that is very unique, I think is that 
we actually try to accommodate both the more conservative and the more liberal congregants in our mosque. We have small, minor details that help us accommodate both groups and make them feel comfortable. For example, the shade that, uh, that partitions the men's area from the women's area, well, they work on two different motors. So if some of the sisters prefer to have the shade up with basically no partition, they're welcome to have uh, at least one shade up. We have um, the main entrance with two uh, different color tiles, so sisters are more than welcome to use the main entrance. Uh, even though there is a designated woman entrance for those sisters who prefer to use that entrance. Uh, but then we have this feature where the tiles have two different colors and one leads into their section. This is a unique design for a mosque in Utah. The, this mosque has a multi-purpose hall which is used for different purposes, which is actually bigger than, the, than this main hall uh, on the upper level. Uh, the UIC was used, is not used by the by Muslim community, but it is used by the entire uh, local community over here. Uh, the multipurpose hall was used by used in November elections in 2021, and as a vaccination clinic in uh, you for you, for Salt Lake County, uh, for Salt Lake County Health Department. So it is a space which is which is. Uh, more often used by not only by the by the Muslim community but by other members as well. Uh, the multi-purpose hall can be used for prayer, but the prayer space, the actual mosques, sometimes cannot be used for all the multi-purpose activities. With a purpose-built mosque, the whole building is facing northeast towards Mecca. That way, your rows will be straight, and they don't have to be diagonal. So it makes the rows look a lot nicer. And then you have a border that is embedded into the design of the carpet, which, uh, which blends in very nicely. Uh, so it's not like you got a string or a permanent marker line going across to mark one row from the other. You have a nice uh, border design. Minaret nowadays is mainly symbolic. In the olden days, people would actually climb on top of the minaret and use their natural voice to give the call to prayer and standing at a higher location, their voice would go much further. Nowadays, we give the call of prayer from inside the mosque, or in our case, from the lobby of the mosque, uh, for two reasons. Number one, the local zoning regulations <laughs> won't allow us to give a call outside. And number two, we don't want to disturb our non-Muslim brothers and sisters. So we give the call from inside the mosque and the minaret has become mainly symbolic. When a person enters the mosque to pray, if he did not make wadu, which means ablution, ritual washing at home before he came, then he needs to wash his face and arms and feet before he prays. That is a prerequisite for prayer to be accepted. If they haven't done the wadu, the ritual washing at home, then the brothers have their wadu area and the sisters have their wadu area to wash up before the prayer. Come to mosque. If you have a mosque in your neighborhood, come to the mosque, sit down, you know, and then come to your own conclusions based on your experience, okay? Uh, my, my humble request is to, to uh, don't believe in what media is saying. Uh, talk to your neighbor, find, if you're going to university, I can assure you, you have Muslim students, your fellow students, talk to them. Uh, if you are a neighbor with, uh, with Muslim, you know, uh, come to their house, go to their house, talk to them. Uh, we invite people, come sit down with us, have a meal with us, right? And uh, this is how we're gonna bridge these stereotypes. This is how we're gonna come together as a human race. When we come together, uh, the you know very common slogan we use in uh, today, matter of fact, is a uh, you know um, a grim reminder of 20th anniversary of 9/11, right? Um, uh, united we stand. That's the message I'm gonna say or send, uh, or I want to close with: United we stand, divided we fall. This country offers great things. 
uh, though we have challenges, it's the greatest nation on earth. Uh, where you can stand up in the media, wherever, you can criticize your political leader, you can criticize your president of this nation. It is not allowed in a lot of other nations, you know? So uh, we have a beautiful country. Uh, us Muslims, everybody else, uh, we are a tapestry, uh, you know, beautiful tapestry. Just think about that. And at the end of the day, we are all human.